Hi, Critical Analysis. This video is for Tuesday, April 7th, week 12. Again, I, I feel like we are just so close to the end of the semester. We are winding down here. We're already in chapter eight, finishing it up, which means we really don't have too much more to go because chapter nine, as I mentioned in a previous video, is kind of an overlap with chapter eight in terms of the concepts. And then chapter 10 is just like a summary, put it all together type deal. So we are really getting close to the end. So today, uh, Tuesday, April 7th, you are submitting your chapter eight text sheet. Uh, I did this with you mostly, like I did some with you and then I asked you to do some on your own in a previous video from week 11. So you are completing the chapter eight text sheet. Here's the text sheet and then you'll drop box it in there or as I mentioned before, some of you have been sending it to me via email attachment. You've been printing it off and taking pictures. Again, whatever is working for you is fine. Just please make sure you're submitting work. That's the key thing. How you submit it to me is not as big of a deal as just making sure that you uh, submit the work so that you're staying up with everything. So what I want to do is spend a little bit of time kind of reviewing the concepts for Chapter 8 because they carry over to Chapter 9 so that when we get to Chapter 9, it'll just be kind of a quick review and carry on type deal. So chapter eight, I use this critical thinking PowerPoint as my main uh, point of lecture. So chapter eight and chapter nine both go into critical reading and thinking. And so they touch on fact and opinion, which we've already talked about in previous chapters, just knowing the difference between a fact and opinion. We know facts are things that are provable, whether they are proven true or false, because we can observe or measure or verify in some fashion. And then opinions are the opposite. We cannot verify them. They are beliefs or attitudes or judgments. So opinions are, you know, things that show good, bad, awful, amazing, and as well as future events. When we make predictions, those are opinions. We also talked about in the chapter six when this concept was first introduced that reason judgment, the thing in between facts and opinions where you are using factual evidence to come to an informed opinion. And so you have to just kind of use context and understand that often authors will present their opinions as facts. And so you have to look at how they are, you know, the words they're using, and then sometimes they will use facts and opinions together. So from there, we talked about author's purpose, like the reason an author has written something. So why did the author write this? Are they writing this to give me information? Are they trying to persuade or convince me to believe something? Are they entertaining me, trying to, you know, just kind of take my troubles away for a little bit? Are they narrating? Are they telling a story? Or are they describing? Are they kind of trying to evoke as many um images, so to speak, as possible. So you kind of, again, find that main idea, ask, why did the author write this? You know, what is the purpose of this? And we looked at some examples on the slideshow and then a little bit in chapter eight as well. Part of these concepts also deal with intended audience for who is the, the article or the text written, and that can help you figure out also the purpose. Connected to this was tone, you know, the author's attitudes or feelings about a topic, because if an author has an attitude or bias, which we also talk about here, um, with a topic, then you may not be getting the full story. You know, think about athletes and actresses and actors who endorse products. They definitely have a tone or an attitude toward a topic because they're making money off of it. And so they might not present the bad. So that goes along with this bias topic we're going to talk about as well. You have to know like both sides of the story. So the tone is how an author feels. And it's usually either going to be positive or negative. And so they're going to use words that indicate that uh, and then that leads into that bias piece, you know, when an author allows you to see their opinion. So they use words which show how they feel. Now, if they are not determining, you know, if you cannot determine what their bias is, maybe they're just giving information that would be considered unbiased. There's no in, uh, kind of feelings evident. They're just presenting facts. Also, another way to be unbiased is to present both sides of the story, so to speak, give that positive and the negative. And that connects to point of view, kind of where an author is coming from. So we looked at a few examples in chapter eight. I'm going to pull up a couple paragraph examples here. Again, if we were in class, I'd be giving you guys packets and papers and we'd be doing all kinds of fun stuff. But alas, we're not doing that. So we're just going to look at some um, paragraphs here on these websites that I have. So we're going to scroll down, and as I read, uh, your job is to try to determine if there is bias present, 
or if there, you know, is there no bias? If there is, is it in favor or against? So the paragraph reads, a movement is building against the commercialism that surrounds Christmas. In 2003, Adbusters Magazine, which argues in favor of a simpler, low-consumption lifestyle, persuaded 5 million people in 65 nations to observe Buy Nothing Day on the day after Thanksgiving, the traditional start of the Christmas shopping season. The magazine also advocates no-buy holidays in which people spend time together rather than buying each other gifts. Books like $100 Holiday encourage consumers to give the gift of time rather than store-bought items. And nonprofit groups like the Center for a New American Dream echo the message that commercialism of Christmas has gotten out of hand, leaving many Americans exhausted, depressed, and deeper in debt. That organization advocates donating to charities instead of buying gifts for family members and friends. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to pause because most of this right here so far is talking about how Christmas commercialism is like we are just we're buying so much stuff we're buying and spending money instead of spending time with one another well then all of a sudden there's this shift right others however argue that Christmas commercialism is a good thing writer Richard Sincera said that every time you buy a Christmas gift a toy a CD player a spice rack a hunting rifle you are helping to pay someone's wages millions of such purchases made every day in the Christmas shopping season keep factories open keep workers employed keep families fed because over 25% of the year's retail business occurs during the Christmas season, holiday commercialism is important to our country's economy. Without it, year-round prices would be a good deal higher. Furthermore, Andrew Bernstein of the Ayn Rand Institute argues that we should celebrate the commercialism of Christmas because it is a sign of prosperity, and that in itself inspires goodwill and friendly feelings toward fellow citizens. Okay, so you can hopefully tell that the author is talking about Christmas and Christmas commercialism. So how I look at this is they spend about half, that first half, saying that it's a bad thing. And then the second half saying that it's a good thing. And so to me, that's pretty even. He's presenting both the good and the bad. He's not saying, oh, you definitely should go out and buy things or you should not go out and buy things. So this is an example where there is no bias. There is no bias here because he presents both sides pretty equally. So that's an example of no bias. If we look at the one right below, this one is going to contain bias. So I'll tell you that before I read it. So as I read, try to determine whether the author is biased in favor of this topic or biased against. Are illegal immigrants good or bad for the economy? Several studies have indicated that the presence of illegal immigrants is good for the country because most will work in low-skill, low-paying jobs. For one thing, their labor keeps prices of many goods and services low. Lindsay Lowell, Director of Policy Studies at the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University, says that products and services are significantly cheaper in the U.S. than in Europe, precisely because so much of the work is done by illegal workers. For example, a high concentration of undocumented workers in the agricultural industry keeps food prices down. Indeed, proponents of allowing illegal workers to stay in the country argue that the U.S. economy could not function without their work. Plus, the average illegal immigrant household pays about $4,200 a year in federal taxes for an annual total of almost $16 billion. All right, so again, the first kind of idea is to find the topic, which here they're talking about illegal immigrants as it relates to the economy. And so... They spend their entire time saying, look, look at all this good that illegal immigrants do. They keep products cheaper. They pay taxes. Um, so actually, this author is showing bias in favor. They are showing bias in favor of keeping illegal immigrants in the U.S. because they do not present any negatives. They do not talk about, you know, maybe they take jobs from other people or whatever other negative possibilities they could bring up. They only talk about the positive. So that is bias in favor. So when you see that an author is not giving the other side of the story or maybe the opposite viewpoint, that is when bias occurs. Okay, let's take a look at a couple more here. So if we look at this paragraph up here, I will show you again or tell you again that as I read, there is bias here. So as I read, try to determine if there is bias in favor or against. Miracles have been defined as divinely caused violations of the rules of natural order. In other words, miracles are events that defy reason and suggest supernatural intervention. Take, for example, the miraculous cures at Lourdes. The International Medical Community of Lourdes, a group of about 20 French doctors, has certified 2,000 unexplained cures, pay attention to how they put cures in quotation marks right there, taking place after people visited the spring where St. Bernadette allegedly 
again, pay attention to these words, saw visions of the Virgin Mary in 1858. For many people, the healing of the sick at Lourdes is a miracle, and the Catholic Church itself officially recognizes 66 of the miracles supposedly performed at Lourdes. Remember, though, that the Catholic Church has also been forced to declare many other, here's that, miraculous events to be hoaxes. For instance, a statue in a church in Thornton, California, supposedly wept and walked around the church at night. Yet no one ever witnessed the statue actually moving. When church officials conducted an investigation, they had to pronounce the wandering statue a fraud. Indeed, both church-sponsored and private investigations of miracles led to logical explanations, often revealing fakes in the process. Every time investigators, such as skeptic and author Joe Nickel, are given the chance to use stethoscopes, x-rays, chemical analyses, and other scientific tools to examine so-called miracles, such as crying or bleeding statues, statues with heartbeats, and people with stigmata, wounds like those of Christ, they easily debunk the supposed miraculous occurrence. Okay, so as I read, I was trying to allow you to pay attention to some of the word choices that this author was using. He uses the words like supposedly, um, debunked, supposed. And when people are putting quotes around words that are not actual quotes from a text, they're trying to be kind of like a sarcastic. And so hopefully you can pick up on the fact that this author does not believe in the existence of miracles. He is biased against. He brings up all these supposed miracles and then goes, nope, they're fakes. They're debunked. Nope, nope, nope. So he is only presenting kind of this against the existence of miracles. He does not talk about any miracle that could potentially op be a miracle. They're all against. Okay, so if I scroll down a little bit more here, I'm going to look at number four. And I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to leave this screen showing. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video, read this quick paragraph on Head Start, and then on pause and we'll talk about what you saw. Okay, hopefully you have paused and read this paragraph on um, Head Start. And so as you read through it, um, they do talk about Head Start and the goal, and then they give all of these great things that Head Start has done. It talks about how like it saves society money, it, it allows students to get caught up with their peers, they're placed in special education less. So this author is showing a bias in favor of Head Start. There's no like, oh, these students fall behind. They don't give any negatives to Head Start. Um, they do talk about critics a little bit, but they're really giving the, the positives to this program. So that is an example of bias and favor. Okay, and then we're going to do just two more practices here. So I'm going to scroll up and we are going to look at number three here. So I'm going to read this one. And our job is twofold in this one. We have to determine the purpose. Remember why this was written. Was it to inform, to persuade, to narrate? Well, we only have two choices down here. Uh, and then is there bias present? So in 1939, the guillotine, the device used to punish convicted criminals by cutting their heads off, was retired as an instrument of public execution. Y'all, 1939, historically, was not that long ago. We were still cutting people's heads off. Uh, because the guillotine was used to take lives, it was not generally viewed as an instrument that benefited humanity. Yet, in fact, at the time of its creation, the guillotine was supposed to have a humanitarian purpose. It would provide every criminal with the gift of a quick and painless death. The man who gave the guillotine its name, Joseph Ignis Guillotin, certainly saw the device as beneficial. In 1789, Guillotin persuaded the French government to pass a law requiring all public executions to be carried out by machine. The goal of the law was to eliminate problems caused by executioners not fully equipped for the job. There were, for instance, some whose hands shook too much to produce a clean slice through the neck, and some whose arms lacked enough strength to bring an axe down full force. Oops. The machine itself was the work of Dr. Antoine Louis, a French surgeon, and Tobias Schmidt, a German harps harpsichord maker. Dr. Louis knew what portion of the neck would most likely succumb to the blow of an axe, and Mr. Schmidt knew how to make the axe sharp enough to cut through flesh with one blow. Very uplifting article here. In 1792, the newly created guillotine got its first victim, a robber named Nicolas Jacques Petier. The execution was pronounced a success, and the guillotine was praised for granting a speedy and seemingly painless death. Okay, so if we look through this, to me what sticks out is we have some years. We have like kind of a, a word, and it's defined, and it's talking about its purpose and who created it. So to me, this is a lot of information. I don't think they're trying to persuade us to feel a certain way about the guillotine, not like, oh, it was amazing, or oh, this is awful. This is really just informative. And so therefore, there's no bias. There's no favor for or against this particular topic. It's just telling us what this is. All right, last one we're going to take a look at. 
Ten years ago, multitasking was all the rage as those lucky enough to be armed with laptops and cell phones bragged about completing three or four tasks at once. Science, however, has given us a second, maybe even third thoughts about the advantages of multitasking. The evidence increasingly suggests that we work more efficiently when we do one thing at a time rather than several. That's because multitasking apparently overtaxes the brain. As we try, for instance, to drive a car, send off a text message, maintain a conversation, and check out a new photo we've just received, the brain is forced to process different kinds of verbal and visual information, all the while maintaining the body's physical coordination. Juggling these tasks pushes the brains to its limits, and the research suggests that the brain becomes overwhelmed by its efforts to keep up. While we manage to get all the tasks done, we don't do any of them particularly well. If you remember, we did a practice with this at the beginning of the semester. In a study at the University of California, LA, for instance, researchers found that multitaskers finished the filing job they were assigned just as quickly as those who were focused solely on one task. The multitaskers, however, didn't remember much about the files or where they had put them. Those who had been doing nothing but filing, in contrast, remembered what it was they'd been putting away and even more importantly, where they had filed the material. All right, so our topic is clearly multitasking. In this, Basically, it's it's trying to tell us like, hey, listen, our brain, we do all these different things and it pushes us to our limits and we actually should be doing better at one task. So this is not just informative. It's not just telling us what multitasking is. It is definitely persuasive in nature. It's trying to convince us to feel a certain way about multitasking. So in this case here, it is against multitasking. There is persuasion and it's against multitasking because it wants us to think of it differently. So as I'm talking about these topics, if you want more practice, because I do have more practices, again, you know, I'm always good for paper. If you want more practice with purpose, you know, if you're just like, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by the different purposes, you know, I have some articles you can read to kind of practice identifying which one of these purposes are being used. I also have some more bias practice because bias is usually one that people get stuck on as well. If you ever feel like you want more practice than what I do in these videos, let me know. I will send you some attachments. I'll send you some links and you can practice them and I can give you feedback. So that's always an option. Just let me know um, about that. All right. So that is chapter eight. So again, your text sheet for chapter eight is due tonight. Tuesday, April 7th. And if you miss these deadlines, please don't think you can't turn it in at all. Please still just turn it in. I give these deadlines so that, you know, for grading purposes and then also just keeping up with everything. But I'm, I'm not like shutting you out completely if you don't get it into me during that deadline. Another thing we have not talked about yet is your quiz. We went over all of the vocabulary words in a video in week 11. So here's your completed study guide. Here is your chapter eight vocabulary quiz. And this is going to be due on Friday of this week, Friday, April 10th. So chapter eight vocabulary quiz, here it is. Correct or incorrect, per usual. Short answer, make sure you are answering the actual question, not just writing the definition, make sure you answer the question. And then we have fill in the blank down here at the bottom. So you are doing that again by Friday, April 10th. The quiz is there, you'll drop box it right in there. Okay, the last thing I want to talk to you about before we wind everything up today is mastery skills again. So mastery skills on your syllabus are due April 24th. I want to try to stick to that just for kind of purposes of getting everything finished. So in mastery skills, your screen you won't see determining meaning from context anymore because everyone has finished that one. The ones that are open are the ones that some of you still need to work on. If you are struggling with any of them, remember I have posted several videos at this point. Inference video is right there. Purpose and tone. I am now officially going to make that available because we have talked about that at this point uh, with chapter eight. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to make post test one. And then if you need it or want extra practice, post test two is also going to be in there. So purpose and tone that goes along with chapter eight and chapter nine concepts is open. It's supposed to be make available. <laughs> there we go. All right. That is open. Fact and opinion, there's a video there. Patterns of organization, there's a video. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a video for critical thinking since we just talked about a lot of those concepts. So critical thinking and author's bias will be coming out very soon. So keep a lookout for those. Please be working in mastery skills. Those are still due April 24th. Uh, on Thursday, April 9th video, I will talk to you about a concept called thesis, and I will talk to you about your final project. Hope everyone has a good day.